listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, Episode 78, brought to you by Betsy Seeds and Safest Gardening Products. Well, folks, today we've got the author, YouTuber, writer, lecturer, Lee Reich. Uh, Lee Reich, if you haven't, he was on the, the podcast last year. If, you, if you're not unaware of, of his uh, track record, <laughs> Lee Reich has a PhD in horticulture. Uh, he's got a background in horticulture and soil science and even a, a background in chemistry. Uh, he worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Cornell University. And he's now a, uh, a writer and lecturer and consultant. Uh, he's featured in the New York Times and uh, Martha Stewart Living, numerous articles and columns. Uh, and he's, he's got a YouTube channel and actually excellent YouTube content. Uh, it's just a very pleasant series of shows to watch, like, like something you'd watch um, back in the old days when there was television, like television. Uh, he's got a half dozen books on... <laughs> Half dozen books on gardening, uh, and today we're going to be talking about a book he wrote back in 2001 called Weedless Gardening. Um, so, Lee, how is it going, and uh, how is spring shaping up in your neck of woods? Tell everybody where you live, Lee. I live in New Paltz, New York, and that's about uh, 90 miles up the Hudson Valley uh, from New York City, about an hour south of Albany. And spring is uh, is coming on. I mean, I, I personally love this time of year because even though we get these setbacks where it's cold and and uh, or sometimes snows, I mean, this time of year, the uh, you know just spring just keeps moving forward no matter what. So right. I like that. I love how there's no uh, black flies. And back in my backyard, I get right. flies and mosquitoes. You can I try to get as much done as I can before those things show up. Yeah, day like today here was great for working outside. It was uh, 50 degrees, and sunny, nice. and uh, you know, not every day is going to be like this, but it keeps getting more like this. And uh, the condition of your soil. So, I mean, a lot of my soil is still frozen, and even some of the beds that might have a, a bit of thaw on top, if you go down an inch or so, it's actually just ice beneath that. Um, what about you? So your gardens that aren't covered or anything like that, or not a greenhouse, just your your exposed gardens or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what's the state of the your thaw in those gardens? I think the soils. I had to dig a deep hole the other day, and and it didn't didn't hit. I didn't hit any frost at all. So I guess we're defrosted. What? I mean, typically, you? typically I I'll be planting my peas um, April first. Right. So so the soil better be defrosted. Frosted by then. I remember one year I had to chop through ice with a hoe to do that, but I've done that. I don't think that'll happen this year. What zone are you in? Zone five. So yeah, I was in six A. You'd think like I'd be. It just goes to show these zones don't tell you everything. Um, right. Well, the zones. What the zones really are based on is how the average coldest it gets in winter. Exactly. I think people use them as a guide for like everything. All they really tell you is how how survivable things will be for given perennials. They don't really tell you your, the length of your growing season, how warm it's going to be, when it's going to thaw. All right. that. I've talked to, I have numerous comments on my YouTube channel of people that are in zone five and they bet this thing's thawed or that thing's thawed or so on and so forth. There's a very uh, popular YouTube channel called uh, One Yard Revolution. Have you ever seen that one? Uh, no. No, it's, it's Google it sometime. He's a guy in uh, Chicago, he's in zone five something, and he's got uh, a lot of plastic domes in his backyard like me, but he's got stuff growing like all the time, whereas I, I can't get anything to happen here. And uh, it's colder where he is in terms of uh, how cold yeah, it is. Yeah, because right, it could be sun plus uh, you have the maritime effect, so you don't get as cold in the winter, so that puts you in that zone six, but you also don't get as warm in the summer. That's right, and we also don't have any damn uh, sun. <laughs> Right, that would be a big factor. Foggy and overcast, and we have the foggy, overcast winters. Um, so I'd rather it be ten degrees colder and sunny. Uh, just uh, yeah, you, you, you know, whatever. Likewise. likewise. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it certainly is a challenge uh, when you when you've got even in the height of summer here, we'll have a lot of days where the sun really doesn't break through till noon because of this fog rolling in from the from the uh, from the from the ocean. Right. Well, you could probably grow really good uh, uh, coal crops, like cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, and maybe you could grow artichokes even. No? 
I haven't tried our artichokes, but all those uh, brassicas you mentioned uh, grow fine and uh, lettuce, peas, yeah, potatoes. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. no, but certainly, and uh, yeah, it's just, you just sort of adapt to what you, you work with what you can. I find pepper is an extraordinary challenge here. Right. Um, all right, so I, I can uh, make a I can make a recommendation because peppers used to be hard for me to grow. Then I started planting a variety called Italian sweet or sweet Italia. And it seems to ripen. I mean, we do have more sun and heat, but uh, of all the peppers I've ever tried, it seems to ripen the earliest and do the best under, you know, less than ideal, meaning more southerly conditions. Sweet Italia? Yeah. Okay, I'm writing that down. I'll see if I can get a hold of some of those. Still got a bit of time. Um, mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, now, one thing that uh, for those that uh, tune into, uh, you know, if you've got, if, you, if you're homesick someday or you want to binge watch something, I would really recommend you check out Lee's uh, YouTube channel. They're very pleasant to watch. I can tell like, the production value of your videos <laughs> is much better than mine. Um, like they, they look sort of professionally edited and so on. They, they actually, they actually were. <laughs> I had a, a, fr a friend that I uh, was doing it and uh, and he, that's what he does for a living and I he's see. done PBS videos so you know he's definitely a professional they actually do you know what they actually do watch like PB like if you watch the this old house or you know uh, Victory Garden they do sort of roll out a bit like that a very pleasant nice music and upbeat and sort of cheery and I think they capture your personality well um, oh. yeah or it's mine, or it's just like, hey, I'm just a guy in my backyard, but there's a camera. <laughs> but I've got 240. I guess I have to check mine out. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're very well done. Um, um, anyway, uh, there's a couple of videos where you mentioned that you know it's not a garden, it's a farm den. So and it's something you, you mentioned in various uh, uh, bits of your writing. Uh, can you contrast for us what, you know, A, what that term means and how you would distinguish that from, uh, from a garden? Yeah, well, when I started out, uh, I had a, uh, when I bought this house, I had a property of three quarters of an acre, and I had a garden in back, and it was very manageable. And then I was always lusting for this field just to the south of me, and then eventually I did uh, buy it. So that was another two acres. Right. Only, and, only, a, and, only a gardener would understand the concept of lusting for a field. <laughs> right, and 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 that's when thing that's when things got out of hand because I grow, a, for instance, I grow hardy kiwi vines, and I since I write about gardening, I'd like to study different varieties and see how they do. So I, I had two hardy kiwi vines when I had a garden, and after I bought the field, I planted twenty. Right, and same thing, you know. Then I planted chestnuts, and I planted. I also grow uh, pawpaw trees in twenties. I planted 20 of them. I had two, but then when I got the, so I was just making, you know, planting on and on. So then I, I all of a sudden hit me one day that this is no longer a garden. But then I was thinking also, it's not really a farm either. Uh, right. This is not big enough and I, I don't make a living from it. I do yeah. sell a few things. So I said it was a farm then. And that's, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> I think my, I mean, my, my setup, I got about a 25, my garden's about the same size as root steps, about 2,500 square feet, give or take, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and I think my wife certainly, my wife certainly calls it a farm, um, uh -huh. but it's not as big as yours. Uh, well, have, well, well, my vegetable gardens are total are probably, it's two gardens and the greenhouse, probably 2,500 square feet, but I grow a lot of fruits also. And then yeah. I have a hay, and I have a hay field that I use for, uh, uh, for hay to feed the common post or the mulch with you know so i got and i have nut trees and all sorts of things growing here that's another i mean this is all stuff uh you speak about um in your book and for those that haven't read it so um lee mentioned that when, when i did the podcast with lee last year he mentioned this book and he sent it to me and i read it uh, i really enjoyed reading it it's a really good book for um either the, the beginner gardener that to say I want to have a garden and I don't know a thing and it's probably a great way to, to start off because you don't get um, you know you don't get your mind poisoned by the conventional gardening you sort of start off with uh, the sort of uh, uh, Lee's approach to gardening is very similar to my own he does a sort of no-till weedless type approach um, but also even for the experienced gardener that wants to get out of tilling their garden every year and 
they've heard about gardening without tilling and that sort of thing, and maybe they want to change gears. This is a good book because it walks through uh, how to do it, why to do it in a very accessible way. So, um, why don't, for, for the sake of the listeners, uh, Lee, why don't you contrast uh, your concept, explain your con concept of weedless gardening, and then contrast that with uh, the sort of conventional gardening that we're, uh, certainly I was raised that way. My father would rent a rototill every year and, you know, for right. 6, 12, 12, and the, all that sort of stuff. So uh, can you contrast those those two approaches? Explain your approach and, and contrast um, contrast it with uh, conventional gardening. Yeah. So, so r right from the get-go, my approach is different. Uh, and I remember when I first started my first garden, I, uh, I actually dug it by hand and and when you, it was lawn, so you dig it by, so the conventional approach is you dig it up and then you got to wait a couple of weeks while biological activity sort of calms down and things break down a little. Then you dig it up again to to, to make it, because uh, it doesn't totally break down. You got to wait another two weeks and then you plant. So my approach for starting the garden is to just kill the vegetation in place, whether it's weeds or grass or whatever. And I start that by just getting everything down to the ground by mowing or by knocking it down. Then I cover with paper. You yeah. could use newspaper, there's landscape paper. Put, uh, wet the paper, put some compost on the top where I'm gonna plant and, uh, and wood chips where there's paths and then just plant, I can plant right away. So that's a big difference in starting it. Uh, first of all, it's quicker. Yeah. Secondly, it preserves the, nat the soil structure. Yeah. You know, beneath a lawn, uh, Lawns have, lawn grass especially has very extensive fine root system and really uh, makes the soil have good tilth. So it sort of seems to me criminal to, to till it up and ruin that good structure. Mm -hmm. So by just killing the grass in place, you preserve that structure. And in addition, there's a lot of other benefits. You preserve organic matter. And then for ongoing maintenance, uh, the conventional approach is, you know, at the end of the year, you till everything and... Uh, and my approach is I have permanent laid out beds and paths in my gardens. And I just uh, lay compost on the beds and wood chips or some other weed-free organic material in the paths. And that's it. Very so it's sweet. simpler. Very similar. It preserves, yeah, and it's simpler. It preserves organic matter, which is very important. And it also, this is why my book is called Weedless Gardening, because it also... Uh, is doesn't promote wheat growth. When you till a soil, you expose the soil to light and weed seeds are dormant, waiting for light to awaken. So basically when you till the soil, you're, you're sowing weed seeds. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Co coaxing them to grow. So that's, that's how I got started on this whole thing <laughs> is I, uh, I decided to just stop tillage. And then I realized I can't just stop tillage because the soil will get compacted from walking on it and and rolling wheelbarrows and all that. So then I uh, just decided to put this on permanent uh, planting beds. <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be raised beds. They can be flat on the ground. So I had permanent areas for planting, permanent areas for walking. And that was 90% there. And, and, you know, there's a couple other things, part of the system I described in the book. But it works really well. Matter of fact, when I first started out, I, um, it works so well that after a couple of years, I was thinking maybe there was something wrong with my soil because I wasn't getting any weeds or enough weeds. And uh, then I realized the system's working. That's what's happening. Yeah, I think there's a, a major misconception among a lot. I mean, I, I work in an office with people and uh, from that day I saw my garden, they look at me like I'm blind. Um, and right, it's, you know, it's, it's always been this, the, you know, Tilling has such been such a tradition, and it's always been the the sign of a good gardener or farmer to have this nicely tilled, uh, you know, garden or farm in spring or in fall, and uh, it's it's hard to break that tradition. I, I always tell people if they really feel like you know, because tilling also I think uh, makes people. Uh, first of all, you get to go outside and get your blood moving in the spring. And maybe you feel like you're doing some good, so you get the feeling of righteousness. <laughs> and uh, I always tell people, if if they if this is you know the the case, uh, why don't they just set aside a two foot by two foot area, and this will be their tilling area, and till it to the heart's content, and and leave the regular garden untilled, and then but make sure you weed that till tilling area because you're going to get a lot of weeds there too. 
I, I always say that planting uh, potatoes helps you deal with your tailing withdrawal um, because you know in the process of removing the potatoes, you usually have to turn it over a little bit to get the, the ones that are you know I plant my potatoes about eight inches deep. Oh, and, um, so uh, and wow. I, I, I put them, but my soil is loose, and I, I literally just twist my hand down until till it's at the wrist, and then I put about a foot of mulch on top of the on top of the soil, and I don't do anything at all um, the whole season. And then when it's time to uh, harvest them, I just push the mulch aside and, and dig them out. Um, yeah. So, and then I don't plant potatoes in that garden bed for three or four or five years. Right. So. So yeah, that's the way I sort of tilling withdraw <laughs> because you kind of hand tilling. I usually just go right. with my hands, but uh, um, and I, and I have to admit, uh, secretly, uh, I do sort of enjoy. Oh, look at that! It's all brown and even, uh -huh. and so on. <laughs> so Lee, I noticed in in, in leafing through your book, um, you mentioned a number of uh, well recognized uh, no-till um, gurus like Ruth Stout and, and people along those lines. But you don't mention um, the, the 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 great grandfathers of, of permaculture, Bill Mollison, and David Holmgren, and uh, or even use the word permaculture. Why do you stay away from describing what you do as as, as that? Well, permaculture entails a lot of things. Uh, you know, integrating animals into the landscape. You know, how you plant, uh, what what kinds of plants, how you integrate them together. Uh, you know, water collection. So there's a lot going on with permaculture. And one aspect of permaculture is that they do not disturb the soil. And that would uh, be similar to what I'm advocating. Uh, but even that, they, they're a little different in their approach there because uh, they tend to use uh, cardboard to smother or to keep weeds at bay. And um, I actually don't like to use cardboard because when I put mulch on, well, when I start a garden and I and I do uh, put down paper and then uh, compost or mulch on top, I just want that paper to last as long as it takes to kill the vegetation underneath. Like a month or and, so. Yeah, about a month or so. And and uh, and then, because I want to really have a continuity of, uh, just like on, I'm trying to emulate natural systems. Yeah. So, in natural systems, you have uh, the surface of the soil is high in uh, undigested organic materials. And then as you move down, it's more and more digested and you get this uh, horizonation of the soil. And okay. I think it just that cardboard can last. I mean, people have told me sometimes it lasts two years, depending I've had on the a, weather. When I first uh, colonized the, the area on my property, which is the garden, it was just, it was just a giant uh, weed area, just 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 like a field, I guess, a field of of weeds, and um, certainly the walking paths. I just cardboarded the whole thing. I, I cardboarded the whole area except for the garden beds initially, um, and then uh, as time went by, I started you know um, developing the space inside there. So I would dig up where I had, I had basically cardboard with wood chips on top of it. And so I'd have an area like that. So I'm going to turn this space into a garden. I'd move the wood chips back and it'd still be cardboard there. Um, yeah. So you're right. It does take, uh, I've heard people say it breaks down fast, but no, I've, I've seen it last a year or more. Sure. Um, yeah, I, mean, I guess it depends type. on, uh, yeah, it depends on the weather condition, how much rain you get, a lot of things. But uh, yeah, so the paper works well. You know, the thing is, even if you lay, if you just lay, uh, wood chips on top of plastic mulch, you know, which people often do to make it look prettier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you do get weeds. It's, you might be smothering out all the weeds coming up from below, but weeds colonize the mulch from above. That's right. They'll so go well, it's, 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 Yeah. So depending on the type of weed, I mean, the plastic right. will capture water in just a way that the weed loves. Yeah. Uh, like something like, uh, what's that called? Colt's foot. Uh, Colts for you know, the Colts book is like, hey, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, you know, I've got totally, you can get on top of it. It's like I've got run of the show here, and Colts but will colonize like, like, uh, or, uh, you know, some of the even more invasive weeds, uh, for sure. Yeah. Even, I mean, I've seen, uh, I've helped people with their gardens before, and they put all that, uh, lands, that black landscaping fabric down, and then put mulch over it in their flower garden. And there's just like an infinite number of weeds rooted right into that. I, I find that right. stuff to be just about the most useless stuff you can have. 
Right, and also I th I think there's be besides being useless, the thing I don't like about it is if you ever want to change what you've done, you know, planting wise, it's uh, you have that that tough plastic uh, material, uh, just a woven material, just buried in the soil, and it's really a pain to get out, especially with the roots growing it. And then and then the biggest thing I think I think it's disrespectful to the soil. Exactly. I don't like to put anything in the soil that uh, you know that shouldn't be there. So it's not any added, it's no added value, you know, like it's, it's, the soil can't make any use of it. And you're, you're basically diminishing uh, the way the, the various organisms in the soil can interact with the mulch above by putting this sort of, it's not like things can't get through it, but it's, it's right. certainly a barrier uh, of a kind, right? right? Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's there, not necessarily permanently, but it's there in a way that's hard to get rid of it if you do want to get rid of it. Yes. <laughs> If you want to get rid of it, you're gonna ruin one of your afternoons getting rid of it. It's uh, not a fun afternoon. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if yeah, if it's been in place for a long time, it's gonna have roots growing through it and all sorts of things going on. It's, it's just be a mess. Incredibly tenacious. Yeah. <laughs> for, for something that's not alive, it's incredibly tenacious. <laughs> right. Um. All right. So let's move on to um one thing that that Lee and I are, are um different about is that uh, Lee, and I, I thought this would be useful for, for my listeners that use this approach, is that, I mean, people have been listening to me, I, I basically start just about everything outdoors and I don't do transplants. If, it's, if I have some catastrophe and I have to have transplants, I just buy them, but um, most years I, I get away with maybe 99% of my garden being direct seeded um, despite having a fairly short season. But Lee, uh, I'm sure he gets things earlier than me, um, does, you know, has a fairly, uh, you have a greenhouse, yes? Yep. And you also yeah. I have some sort of uh, uh, lighting situation inside your house as well? No. Oh, everything's in the greenhouse? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's, that's uh, better in a lot of ways, I guess, because you're getting the, the full spectrum of light. Um, so Lee does right. transplant. I used, I used to have... I used to have a lighting system in the house, but after I got the greenhouse, I thought uh, might as well not burn the electricity, just use a greenhouse. And is your greenhouse heated at all? Yeah, uh, minimally. Minimal. It's, it's heated. It's like a Mediterranean climate in the greenhouse. It's uh, cool, moist winters and hot, dry summers. And do you uh, like have a heat? It gets down to, yeah, it gets, to, it gets down into the 30s. Do you have a, something to keep it from freezing in there, like just in case, like, uh, or is it, does it just maintain itself? Oh, no, it has to, it gets down to 20 below here, uh, 20 below Fahrenheit right? Uh, outside here. So in the greenhouse, I have to have a supplemental heat. Yeah, it's a propane heater. You have a little heater there to keep it, keep it. Uh, well, keep it's it. not that little. <laughs> <laughs> right. At least, at least price-wise. Yes. yes, I can imagine. <laughs> right. So, uh, so Lee uh, starts a good, good, good number of his, uh, and also just for optimizing your yield and stuff like that, he, he does transplants. And um, uh, what page is that? Like page uh, of the book, uh, page uh, 120, uh, uh, let me see. 21, 120, 122 to 124. Something I found really interesting is that he made a table that uh, suggests uh, sowing dates and and also um, sowing dates both for transplants and things you're you're planting directly. You have a, um, you can talk more a little bit. I'll get Lee to explain this a little bit more as we go on here. But uh, sowing dates and also when to plant things out, um, depending on when your uh, average spring frost is. And for those that are interested, uh, I've worked with Lee to develop a. a Table in Excel, Microsoft. If you have if you have that on your your computer, a Microsoft Excel file, which has this table on it, and um, it's basically got a whole bunch of different varieties of vegetable, from A to T sort of thing, arugula to turnip, um, and what you can do on this table is punch in your uh, average spring frost date and your average fall frost date, and it it will it will. Uh, uh, depending on what date you put in, it'll give you all those planting dates uh, for all those varieties of plants. And it, it suggests the earliest planting date and also the la latest, but we're appropriate. In some things, it doesn't really work that way because they just take too long, like uh, celery, for instance. There's no late planting date. You got to start early or you're just not going to get celery. 
but uh, you know, for certain things like like arugula, right, or spinach, you can you can plant it late and have a fall crop. So he he the table suggests when would be the latest you might want to do that. And actually, your times just just looking at the table aren't too far off of I would think of middle of August. Your table suggests something like middle of August for planting arugula and uh, things like that, and uh, similar to where I am. Um, same with yeah. spinach. Yeah, so it's, it's it's the earliest date you could do it for, you know, a spring or a summer crop, and then the latest planting date is for the fall garden. Uh, obviously, if you plant it too late, then uh, things won't ripen in time. So the latest planting date, um, you know, after that date, uh, you just shouldn't do it. So if you're if you're listening in and you're sitting in front of your your computer. Um, you can go in the description box of, of, of this or, or you can go to Lee's website. I'll have some links to stuff like that. And you can bring this thing up while uh, Lee's talking so you can sort of see what he's talking about. Of course, if you're in your car listening to this on your work, you just kind of have to look it up when you um, get home or if you've got a you know, nice cushy job, maybe look it up when you get to work. <laughs> <laughs> tab, all tabs. Or, um, anyway, <laughs> depending on your situation. Um, so Lee, uh, explain uh, your your reason for creating this table, and uh, if, it's, if, if 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 you can sort of uh, do it in words, uh, uh, you know wh wh what you were getting at in creating. I think it's a really useful resource for gardeners, especially gardeners that are gonna. When do I start? You know, a lot of people I talk to will say like, when should I start getting my tomatoes going? When should I start my peppers? When should I start this? When should I start that? And this this table is 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 aimed at that uh, in a lot of ways a transplant gardener. So can you just uh, talk us through it a little bit? Yeah, I well, I think uh, if you really want to get the most from, say, your vegetable garden, I think timing is is uh, crucial. And people, yeah. uh, you know, like sometimes people say around here, uh, they might say, well, you know, they put their, it always bothers me when they say they, they're going to put their garden in Memorial Day, which here is uh, end of June. No, end of May. Yeah, we call that uh, Victoria. That's the Queen's the Queen's birthday here in the in the in the colonies. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing. We have, it's so, also called so, uh, May two four weekend. It's a you usually have the Monday off, and most people drink a lot of beer. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so 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 most people. So it sort of bothers me when they say they're putting their garden in because really there's things you can and should plant before then and things you can plant after then yeah. and should plant after then. And it totally discounts like, you know, a, a fall uh, garden. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the fall garden. If uh, people don't realize that, you know, after tomatoes and peppers start to wane, if you have your timing right and you, and you sow these plants, you can have uh, as the, as you know, cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers are sort of fading out. You could have this lush green garden of, of uh, uh, cabbage and kale and spinach and lettuce and celery. So it's really uh, good to get the timing right, but you have to know when to do it. So I made this table, and this I, for this table I joined a lot of reading and a lot of my own experience, and it basically when to plant uh, is is really uh, geared by uh, f the average date of the first last frost in spring and the first frost in fall. So um, what Greg has done is he he's made the table. In my book, I have the table and you can figure it out, but he's made it even easier where you just put in those two dates, which you can get from your cooperative extension office. Is that what they call that there? Uh I, I would go, um, I'll provide a link where you can go to get it from Canada. You can get it from our sponsor, Vesti Seeds. They have all those time for whatever province you are in yeah. Canada. And it, it basically by major city, it lists about three major cities per province. There's other, I'm sure they're getting it from somewhere else, probably from, I'm not exactly yeah, sure where. Agriculture Canada. Probably Agriculture uh, Canada, exactly. Yeah, so you put, you put in those dates and then all you gotta do is look at the table uh, and you know pick the vegetables you wanna plant and it tells you when the earliest planting date is and when the latest planting date is. Right. And from, the, uh, from the book, you actually have to uh, sort of count back numbers of weeks, but uh, <laughs> using the table, it just says it right there. So it's, it's quite easy and quite useful. Yeah, and for the transplants, you'll have um, on the table, you'll see uh, one or two or three or four asterisks uh, next to the plant uh, that suggests, so that basically is suggesting you should transplant this. 
Um, and it's basically, depending on how many asterisks there are, it's uh, different, different, um, different suggestions for um, the table will give you a planting date, a sowing date for, for starting it uh, indoors. And then uh, the asterisks will tell you when to plant it out, um, I guess, relative to when, uh, you know, all risk of frost is, is uh, right. over. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people uh, uh, go, like to go with their gut in gardening, which I don't agree with. Say, you know, if it's um, where I am, uh, the last spring frost is a little after the middle of May, and and you know, if you go with your gut, sometimes we get a little warm spell in February, even. And if you decide, okay, I'm going to sow tomatoes because it's getting warm already, you're going to have really leggy plants that will be too big to transplant. Uh, smoothly into the garden when it's time to transplant them, or you might uh, just go with your gut and plant the tomatoes out too early. So I think this table is useful for uh, you know reining in those those uh, impulsive plantings. <laughs> I think a lot of people do is start things a bit early, um, and also, uh, and I I am not immune to uh, putting things uh, out too early and being too brazen and too brave. Um, you know, strange. I mean, last year we had an insane, insanely weird year uh, where, uh, you know, the, we had a, a June frost and then it, it wiped out the leaves on my um, grape plants. And, uh, you know, all my, um, so, I mean, by that point, in the, so middle, by middle of, um, I think by first of June, I had taken, the, I've got these sort of like portable plastic domes in my garden and I had them. So just like I did this year, I, I sowed my um, kale and stuff like that under those, uh, like around this time of year. Um, so instead of doing transplants, I do that. I just left the domes on to make it a bit warmer in there, and they were doing really well. And then I took the domes off those gardens around the uh, end of May, and I put them on other gardens to direct seed my squash to get those things sort of jump started. And, and most years that's fine, but last year we had this weird frost in uh, June. And uh, the beets, Swiss chard, kale, everything but the lettuce and spinach was just flattened. It, it didn't kill the plants, but it, it, it probably, all, my, all the plants in those categories lost, I would say, 70% of their foliage. I and mean, they came back. Um, but plants that you would think that were tough, like people are always saying how tough Swiss chard is. Um, <laughs> it was literally, it was like someone took a blowtorch to the garden. Um, the only plants that, that withstood that cold was the uh, spinach and lettuce. Um, those are the toughest plants. <laughs> and, and peas. The peas were okay as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, it also depends on how the plants are growing. If they're growing under very, you know, lush, succulent conditions. And possibly because you had them in the, in the domes, they might have been a little lusher and softer growing than oh, if they had been outside. They were tender. So not acclimated to the cold as, well, as much. Tender baby. Yeah. That's you know yep. that is a good point because the uh, the spinach had been exposed for I mean the spinach was started off that way too but um, yeah I think it had been exposed a bit longer um, but even <laughs> I sowed um, tomatoes in the middle of May outside in a cold frame they were growing great um, they were probably uh, I would say ten inches high in the middle of June and I came out the day after that frost and they were literally gone. Like it is like they'd just been vaporized. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like despite the cold frame, like the cold frame almost needed another layer of plastic over it. Um, but this is a unique year. Not, not all years are like that. Um, so but anyway, right. the whole, po whole point is that uh, I've certainly had years where, uh, you know, I was at the, uh, you know, the garden center and I was buying seeds and, you know, let's say it's the middle of May for where I am is a bit early to be planting things out. Um, but I've had years where, oh, it's like a Saturday and it's May 15th and it's warm and it's nice and you just, well, geez, how could it possibly get cold after a day like today? And you go and buy a couple right. dozen transplants and put them in the garden and then they're all dead. Uh, well, well, that, that, well, this, well, this table or that sort of highlights some important point with respect to this table that, uh, you know, a lot of gardening of winter set stuff out is uh, based on, on averages. So in an average year. These are the correct planting dates. Yeah. And of course, no year is exactly the average, but since you don't know the future, 
you have to go with averages. Well, that's the weird thing. I noticed on uh, at least the, the, the resource that was provided by Vessi's, um, they give a range. Um, so for like Halifax, I can't remember what it is now, but they don't give you a particular date. They'll say it's between, you know, May, uh, I'm, I'm just going to pick a number off the top of my head, don't quote me on this. They'll say between May 15th and May 21st, for instance. They, they, they don't actually give a particular date. They give a range. So for anyone out there, I would, I would err on the conservative side and just pick, <laughs> pick the later. Right. Well, because a one week, you know, one week delayed planting of a seed, for instance, or even setting out of a transplant, doesn't mean a one week delay in the harvest if it's during the cool season. That's right. Because the one that was planted first doesn't grow that much if it's cooled out. No, it just waits, you know, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or or even if it's, yeah, if it's too cool, the roots may uh, may be a bit uh, bothered by the planting out. Yeah. I should ask you, since I got you on here, um, I, I have found, and like, you know, I direct seed everything, but certain things I have found are really, really, I mean, you mentioned things like parsnips and carrots and stuff like that, but I have found um, squash in particular, um, I mean, I direct see my squash and I get a pretty good yield, but I have found them very difficult. I, I just, I would, I, I, just, I often give people the advice. They hate being transplanted. I assume because your book suggests that they get transplanted. Um, what is your, well, what is well, your they, trick for that? They do hate, they do hate being transplanted, but the things you have to do it carefully. First of all, you don't start them off in small containers that you have to keep uh, moving to a larger container. Right. So typically I'll start them in four inch pots. And, uh, you know, when they're ready to transplant, the roots should really fill the pot nicely, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you just tip them out of the pot, you just don't disturb the roots at all and, and just ease it right into the ground. So, I mean, ideally the plant doesn't even know it's been moved. Ideally, yeah, exactly, yeah. So you, the solution is to to not have them in those little tiny things, but to have them, right. in, you know, don't go cheap on the on the pot, on the pots or the yeah. And then water, uh, yeah. Make sure to keep up with watering it once they're in the ground, just because for the first few days before the roots start growing into the surrounding soil, it's basically as if it's in a pot. So if you were watering a pot every day, you'd have to water that almost every day. Right. Right until it starts to send out, uh, you know, starts to send the roots out further. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that's. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to speak to with regard to this table? No, I think that pretty much covers it. It's pretty self-explanatory, right. especially with your <laughs> your great uh, uh, thing they have on the web. Gee, thanks. So we'll put that. Uh, we'll put that up. I'll put it up on my thing. Leo put it up on his thing. There's. There's a, a little graphic near the top, which is a, which has a hyperlink to uh, the Lee's website if you want to buy his book, um, Weedless Gardening. Uh, of course, it's got a hyperlink to the Maritime Gardening Podcast. If you want to listen to uh, any one of the other uh, 76 podcasts <laughs> I have, you can even listen if you haven't uh, listened to me. I did a podcast with Lee last uh, was it fall. Um, yeah, I can't remember when it was, but yeah, exactly. uh, that sounds about right. I think we did one or two, or I might have divided it up into two. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, you, you can uh, check that out as well. Um, Lee, I want to thank you for coming on the show again. I'm really pretty, and thank you for sending me this book. Uh, again, Weedless Gardening, the Hassle-Free All-Organic System. Um, you know, I'm not, I, don't, I don't plug things that I, I don't, I'm not interested in. I was, this is definitely... Um, I found it worth reading, you know, so uh, it's definitely worth, worth uh, a leaf through. And it's not, uh, how many, how long is it? Some people care, but I always think <laughs> it's, it's about, I don't know, 180 pages of reading, give or take. Um, so it's yeah. not, uh, I, I basically read this whole thing. This was just in the bathroom in the magazine rack. And it just basically, uh, <laughs> that's how I, di I digest books while I'm doing the other end of my digestion. <laughs> it's my preferred way to read. Uh, I know the odd time I take it with me and, and sit on the couch and read it. But, uh, you know, it's definitely the kind of, I, and I find books like gardening books, the kind of books that you want to sort of reread. Um, uh, instructional books, I like to, maybe it's just a student in me, but I, I don't like reading at once. I like rereading things and coming back to stuff and, um, you know, just, just mulling them over. So it's definitely a, a book that's uh, worth mulling over. So uh, thank you. Yeah, for well, thanks. And yeah. 
Yeah, and thanks for having me on the show. And thanks also for making that, uh, the table that I thought was quite useful in the book even more useful on the web. Yeah, no, it, it's actually inspired me to think about uh, doing something like this uh, for, for other sorts of things. I just, uh, there's got to be a way to put this, put this algorithm to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just a question of uh, imagination and what could be added. So uh, perhaps uh, going forward, there'll be, uh, I, can, I can broaden this thing out and add more to it, so on and so forth, add, add other kinds of uh, useful things. Anyway, more to come on that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, everybody, uh, thanks for listening. Lee, thanks for coming on the show. Um, hope we can have you on again. And, yeah, uh, I would love that. Hey, that's great, and I look forward to that. Everybody out there, if you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy the YouTube channel, check out the offer from my sponsors uh, in the description box or in the show notes. There's coupon codes there. If you need something for your garden and they sell it, buy it from them and help support the YouTube channel, help support the podcast and everything I'm doing here. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and uh, and if you did, please like, share, subscribe. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden, and thanks for listening.